uh, I invite you to stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us declare our trust in our loving Creator. God, your love is the one true constant in our lives. When we are overwhelmed by day-to-day -day stresses, you are there to strengthen us, to guide us, and to ease our burdens. We have come to be renewed by your faithful love. Give us a desire to grow in your word, to follow Jesus, and to bring your love to a needy world. Let us also confess our sins and seek God's forgiveness. Lord God, I have not loved you with my whole heart, and too often I have neglected to love my neighbors as myself. I have not helped others when I could have. Forgive the sins of my actions and inaction. Cleanse my heart and bring me back to you. God knows our hearts and is always pleased when we come to him in prayer. Let us find joy in the truth of God's deep abiding love for us that he has shown in his son Jesus Christ who died for our sins and who rose so that we may have the hope and joy of life with him here and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Open Now Thy Gates of Beauty. Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. You may be seated. We hear the scriptures. first reading is written in the 8th chapter of Nehemiah. The people of Israel had been enslaved by Babylon for nearly 70 years. Persia conquered Babylon and soon released them to return to their homeland. Nehemiah was their leader and Ezra the chief priest. They are credited with organizing and rebuilding Jerusalem. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructed, instructing the people said to them all, This day is the holy, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the word of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is written in the 13th chapter of Romans. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. According to St. Luke, the fourth chapter, Jesus has already been uh, baptized. He's gone out, the temptations and so forth, and now he has begun his ministry, and word is spreading, and then he goes to his own hometown of Nazareth. Luke chapter 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. 
and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. You know, in our Old Testament lesson, um, they had been in bondage. They had been enslaved by Babylon and finally were freed by Persia when, when Persia conquered Babylon and sent back. But they needed to reconstitute themselves, if you will, as a people to find again their strength was in the Lord. And so here we see Nehemiah and Ezra uh, bringing that as leaders of that, uh, as, as, as those people, the people that had returned and reading the law of God and reminding them that it is, the, it is in the joy of the Lord that we find our strength. Well, Jesus often points to the Old Testament. He quotes the Old Testament many times, especially when he's teaching. But here, when he comes back to Nazareth, he's handed the scroll. He's already been out preaching and teaching and so forth, probably doing healings and so on. And he comes back, and people are talking about him. He's becoming known around the countryside, around the area. And so he's kind of like the guest preacher. And that's what you do. You hand them uh, the scriptures, and they read. And he rolled to the very scriptures that he wanted to point to. And then it says that he sat down. But that's how rabbis taught. They would sit. They, they would sit in front of the assembly. And oftentimes they would teach and preach, but also there was allowed some, some give and take, some questions that could come also from the congregation. And Jesus points to the Old Testament. But also the reality is the Old Testament points to Jesus. And that, that now he is saying, I am fulfilling these words, these promises that God had made. Jesus isn't starting a new religion. Jesus is a Jew. He's as a line of David. He's coming as, if you will, the leader, the new leader of his people. Will he be accepted? He affirms the Sabbath. It says, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He practiced all the things that were expected of being a Jew of his day. He revered the scriptures and quoted from them many, many times in his teachings. That's what he pointed to. Here he honors the synagogue with his presence and his teaching. He honors his own hometown. He comes home. The carpenter's son. There was only one temple. That was in Jerusalem. That's where they would go to make their sacrifices. That's where they would journey for special uh, commemorations such as Passover or Rosh Hashanah or many things that they would make special pilgrimages to Jerusalem to go to the temple. But the synagogues were everywhere. They were like the churches of their day. In fact, church really means assembly. And that's what synagogue means. It's, it's the assembly of the people. It's not the building. It's the people that make a synagogue. It's the people that make a church. And they were also, the synagogues were the schools. That's where they would learn. They would be taught Torah. They would be taught how to read and so forth. And they would memorize the scriptures. This was their, their way that they would learn. But it was also 
a community center. It's where the people would gather. Just like many times, especially in olden days, so to speak, in the church, there were many times when people gathered in the church for different things, for fellowship events, for all kinds of things. It also served as an informal court. When people had disputes, they would bring them to the rabbi, they would bring them to the synagogue. Jesus is Jewish. He's at home in the synagogue. He's not coming to start a new religion. He is reforming the faith of the people, the faith of Abraham, bringing them back to the scriptures, trying to help them to understand what is it that God really wants. Luther never intended to leave the Catholic Church. What he wanted to do was reform the church, bring it back to the scriptures, bring it back. This is, this is what we have grown out of. This is what we need to be tied to. It's kind of like we just saying, you know, God's word is our great heritage. That's what, that's what Nehemiah and Ezra were saying. It is our heritage. This is the foundation. That's what Luther was saying. This is foundation. And that's what Jesus was saying. God's word is our foundation. But you have moved away from it. Come back to its true meaning. Jesus grew up a carpenter's son, probably a carpenter himself, yet he is teaching. He's a lay rabbi, if you will. He is invited to read from the scriptures, and he chooses from Isaiah the scriptures that we read. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down in front of everybody. And their eyes were fixed on him. And he began to teach, saying, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's the fulfillment. He's the one that was promised. At his baptism, the Spirit of the Lord descended, the Holy Spirit. He's anointed. He begins his ministry. These are gracious words that he's speaking. He proclaims the year of the Lord's favor, God's favor. God's grace, unmerited favor, to proclaim the good news to the poor. You know, it seems, and it's oftentimes they look at, you know, who are the blessed of this world? It's the people who have money. It's the rich. It's the powerful. They seem to have everything. But Jesus points and says, no, I've come for the poor. Paul himself wrote of the early church, he wrote to the Corinthians, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, when you became Christians. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised. God chooses the simple. He chooses the poor in spirit, the meek, the humble, the salt of the earth. This is not for the powerful, but this is for the people who are willing to turn to God, to be God's people. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. Many times people are imprisoned by various things, their own sins sometimes, Sometimes it's, it's being in bondage to someone else. He promises recovery of sight to the blind. But not just the physically blind, because oftentimes people are spiritually blind. To set the oppressed free. Those oftentimes who are under the weight of perhaps even Satan. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are gracious words. 
freedom, healing, God's favor. And that was over against. Who are the ones that opposed him? Oftentimes it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees. They were the keepers of the law. But they, they saw it as being these strict regulations and they, they defined what people had to do meticulously. And Jesus told them, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. You love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. But you experts in the law load people down with burdens they cannot hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift a finger to help them. They had created hundreds of regulations, things that, that became a burden, things that, that, that really, that's what became the focus for people instead of what God really wanted, which was their hearts. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. See, these are the commands from Deuteronomy and from Le Leviticus that everything hangs on. He simplified it. While they were about all these religious regulations, he was about a religion of the heart because that's what God wanted. Again and again in the Old Testament, oftentimes the, the, they were, the, the prophets would say, you know, you come and you make these sacrifices, you do this, you do that. But you don't bring justice. You don't bring love. You don't bring the things that God really wants from his people. Jesus taught love for God and love for one another. These are gracious words. Jesus said to them, you, you matter to God, every single one of you. He said, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your own head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. That God's there and God cares. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news. Anointed. That's the word that we would translate also Messiah from Hebrew. Mashiach. Anointed. Anointed by God. That's what they would do for kings. And they were expecting a king from the Davidic line who would deliver Israel from foreign bondage and restore the glories of its golden age. Restore. To restore Israel. To restore the people of God. And Jesus does. He ushers in a golden age. But it's not the one they're expecting. It's a golden age of love. Of commitment to God. Jesus wasn't what they had hoped for. But I hope it's who we hope for. Instead of railing against the Romans, he chastised the religious leaders. And Jesus ushers in this golden age of love and of grace, of forgiveness, of healing. Grace and love do not make everything right. It's not that all of a sudden life is going to be one of ease. It certainly wasn't for Jesus. It wasn't for his disciples. God's grace gives us peace within life, even when things aren't all right, as we trust, as Jesus did in his final days, as we pray, as Jesus did, accepting God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done. We can find the courage and the peace. We can find the strength to carry on. Grace is not a ticket to paradise or some easy happy ending. It's not escape from reality. It's grace within reality, within our lives, whatever is coming. Grace does not cure all ills. 
Grace does not turn our kids into winners, at least not in the worldly sense. Grace is rather being touched by knowing the love that God has for each and every one of us, that we are his beloved children. Grace can help us face reality, knowing in the end it will all work together for good, for our place with Christ in the heavenly realms. Grace helps us to see life more clearly, to endure hardships with, well, with grace, or admit when we are wrong, and we need to. It's knowing that in the midst of life, with all of its ups and downs, we know it's all right because God is there, and God truly cares. He's there with us. We see it in God's Son, Jesus, who went to the cross for us, to win for us eternal life with him. Grace is the word for all that God is for us in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus is saying. I'm here to bring God's saving grace. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recover of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, grace, gracious words and deeds. Let us live by faith in the one who has called us through his son, enlightened us with his holy word, and keeps us in true faith through his Holy Spirit. You don't see circuses around a whole lot anymore, but um, one of the things I enjoyed when, when sometimes we would see circus acts Sometimes it would be at the state fair or, or we had gone to Baraboo and different things. And one of the things I always enjoyed was the trapeze act. Seeing them up there doing the things they're doing. Flying around, the gymnastics, the timing. Beautiful. The near misses. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes they did miss. And there would be a net that would catch them when they fell. They would jump up bounce up and go try it again. Life can be like a trapeze, requiring gymnastics, timing, and sometimes near misses. Sometimes we fall. But grace is our net so that we can bounce back and we can try again. Living a life of grace and love just as Christ did. Others should be able to see and to watch. Look, See how they live, how they love one another. Look how well they treat their spouse, their kids. They're good, honest workers. They're good neighbors. They're the salt of the earth. That is to live by the grace of God. What happens when we slip? The net is there. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ has provided forgiveness for all of our trespasses both the net and the ability to stay on the trapeze are works of God's own grace, gift. Trust in God's amazing love for you and live his life of love. This past Monday, we remembered um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we should remember that he was a pastor. He was a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ. Today, like in his day, there are tensions between blacks and whites. He was asked about faith in Jesus by blacks who distrusted the white majority. His response? The color of Jesus' skin is of little or no consequence. The whiteness or blackness of one's skin is a biological quality which has nothing to do with the intrinsic value of the personality. The significance of Jesus lay not in his color, but in his unique God consciousness and his willingness to surrender his will to God's will. He was the Son of God, not because of his external makeup, but because of his internal spiritual commitment. 
He would have been and no more significant if his skin had been black. He is no less significant because his skin is white. He was the unique son of God. It's not about the color of our skin, but the content of our character. As Christians, we should have a Christian character. May we put our trust in Christ as the Savior, but also as our Lord and follow him. Amen. Our uh, hymn will be Lord of All Hopefulness. It's a Christian hymn. Uh, it's one I really like. Uh, it's uh, by an English writer, uh, Jan Struther, who wrote it back in 1931. It's commonly set to the melody of an Irish folk song, Slain. Um, this melody is named after the hill of Slain, where St. Patrick lit an Easter fire in defiance of the pagan king near the village that had the same name in Ireland. Many of our favorite hymns are put to old common folk tunes. Slain is also the melody that we know from the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. I love this hymn because it reminds us that Jesus lived just as we did, just as we do. We live by faith. We live by hope. We live with the Lord's joy, patience, peace, love in our hearts. As we walk through our day and all of our days, Jesus may be our example. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let's sing together, Lord of all hopefulness. Please stand. affirm our faith together in the God that calls us through his son, Jesus Christ, and enlightens our minds, empowers us for ministry, and keeps us in true faith through his Holy Spirit. In the words of the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, 
the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us lift up our hearts in prayer with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the grace of God incarnate. Help us to turn to you when life hurts, when life seems out of control. May we find peace in our souls as we put our trust in you. And give us your compassion for the less fortunate. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, watch over this congregation as we journey into the future. Guide the leadership of this church. Guide the call committee as they discern the calling of a new pastor to shepherd this flock. We turn to you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Creator, over 84 million are displaced from their homes due to wars, persecution, oppression, and natural disasters. We pray for their protection and safety, but also for all those who are helping, especially relief agencies. Bring to mind ways that we can help and support those displaced peoples and those charities that help them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Abba, Father, we bring before you those in need of your healing and comforting touch. We lift up Kevin Schultz, Marlene Thompson, Lynn Brzezinski, Harry Kwasny, Connie Schiesel, Don Tiener, Lorraine Rindle, Dolores Johnson, Ginger Linsmeyer, Bob Klesick, Doug Wilson, the Andrew Madsen family, Jim Lawrence, Ron Christensen, Helene Jones, Merle Graff, and Wayne Allen Husky. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we also lift up to you those serving in the military, especially Daniel Brandle, Matthew Brill, Dial, Kyle and Dylan Conrad, Corey Evenson, Carter Hildebrandt, Jeff Kahns, and Andy Schnell. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we lift up to th those having a birthday this week. Rick Schultz, Randy Neumeyer, Chase Wilker, Nicole Benke, Libby Olson, Marilyn Schad, Jeffrey Evenson, Sue Peterson, Kenneth Evenson, Ray Madsen, Jody Kaler, and Jacob Halverson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now let us pray together the prayer by which our Lord taught us to pray, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for Holy Communion. The words of institution, in the words of institution, we hear Jesus' promise of forgiveness of sins through his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Let us take a moment to reflect on our need for this forgiveness of sins. Do you believe that you are forgiven of all your sins for Jesus' sake? Yes, I do. You are forgiven as you have believed. And now, Lord Jesus, be present with us as you were present with your disciples and make yourself known to us in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. You may be seated. Please come, for all are welcome, guests and everyone. All that's required is that we simply and truly believe in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor. And give you his joy, his peace, and his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art.
sharing God's word, showing God's love, and serving God's world. Amen. Thank you for being with us.